Oh, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Max. Yep. It is Louis, but it's all good. It's, I'm used to it. Um, yeah, we're doing a presentation today. Of, well, I say it's a presentation. It's more like a, I, I kind of like the idea of this being a bit more of an active conversation that we can all have. Um, I will have a whole bunch of points to, to chat about. But um, yeah, please do throw any questions in the voice chat channel at any time. And uh, I can pick those up as we go through. Um, the title of the talk today is Why ESG Policies Will Never Change the Future of the Gaming Industry. Um, and it's really about how to spot a good company to work with uh, and making sure that you're happy in the work that you do. So although ESG policies are very much uh, something very uh, heavy in governance and policy, uh, you know, it's, it's not really something maybe for artists and programmers, um, they do affect everyone and uh, they are becoming more and more important in today's world. So um, I think it's probably an important thing to, to highlight. So yeah, I'm gonna, uh, am I able to share screen here? It looks like I can. Let's go ahead and do that. Here you go. So hopefully that's come through okay. Um, awesome, right. So um, close that, cool. Uh, let's get started then. So uh, I guess the first things first, um, like I was saying, so what is this talk really about? Um, it's about finding a company that aligns your values. And this, the values here could be uh, in diversity and inclusion, um, your environmental values, just the way that you like to work, uh, making sure that passion's first, that sort of thing. Uh, and these are quite important in the gaming industry, more so than I guess some other industries. Um, we are all in the gaming industry because we love what we do. And ultimately, you're trying to find a company when you're, when you're looking for a career in the games industry that actually really aligns with you. Um, and it's, it's got to be more than just you know, creating 3D art uh, or something like that. It's really got to go deeper. So that's what this talk is, is about, it's sort of a top-level uh, discussion on it. So first things first then, uh, what's MLC? So I'm the studio director at MLC, um, it's Magna Lunum Creatives. We're an art studio. So um, we're actually built primarily on a network of freelancers and we are always hiring. We're actually hiring at the moment. Uh, so do apply. I can send for a link afterwards. But um, what we do is we work with game studios and game developers who are looking to outsource some of their artwork. So we're an outsourcing studio. Um, we are unique in the way that we're structured being a uh, pretty much all um, uh, freelance based. Uh, but the core of what we do is animation, characters, concepting, um, you know, cinematic trailers, uh, all that sort of stuff, really. Anything that's very creative focused. We don't do any programming. Um, you can see here some pictures from, uh, I think it was a week or two, I guess about a week ago. Um, even uh, some people in here actually were actually at the event. But this is something we do every year where we get the team together and we just, uh, you know, have some beers, uh, marshmallows on the fire, a couple of barbecues, some pizza, uh, and we really just get to hang out because we are a remote team. Um, and it's so, so important that remote teams get this part right. Um, hopefully my uh, internet connection, I don't know if it's uh, coming out, the stream quality, hopefully it's good. I might just change it to 1080p. There we go, hopefully that's all right. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, one of the things I also really want to talk about is how do we promote individuals in our team? Um, and these are things that you can translate to other teams. So, so obviously, I can speak from the perspective of MLC, um, but I really want you guys to, to take value from this. And I think the best way to gain the value is to actually think about how does this apply to when I'm looking for a career in the games industry or when I'm looking to make a career shift in the games industry? Um, and, and hopefully, this kind of helps you see you know, maybe you're in a toxic environment and you don't know what you're missing, or maybe you're not really sure what sort of caliber of companies there could be out there. And hopefully this kind of gives you a bit of an insight. But the way that we promote individuals in our team, we do it in so many ways. Um, we, as you can see, you know, we're, we're a whole bunch of people in here. We have a very flat hierarchy. That's actually me there at the back. Um, but really what's important is, um, you know, just making sure that everyone un sort of understands the values of MLC and we're all aligned together. Um, but promoting people is all about making sure that the company you work for is uh, sort of leveling up your skills, cares about the work you're doing, you're not on a conveyor belt uh, and these sorts of things. We could talk a bit more about them in a bit. Um, but I guess, yeah, one thing to highlight is how has MLC built a successful remote environment? Building a remote environment is something I've spoken to so many people about, and um, I have never met somebody who has said uh, a remote environment is better, 
like straight up better than a, an office environment or a hybrid environment, which most people are in right now. Um, I wouldn't say there's a better way, but I would say what we've created is um, a, such an inclusive community of, of artists and the game developers I was talking about earlier. Um, and we've done that by, you know, like I was saying, promote the individual individuals, bring people together. Um, we've got like game nights and pizza nights that we host. Um, you know, we let anyone raise a challenge and say, um, you know, this isn't working in, the, in my day to day work. This isn't working or this is working really well uh, and providing that feedback. So it's to us, it's so important to have that communication between everyone in the team, not just like project managers or senior leadership but also all the way to to anyone like a you know it could be a junior artist uh whatever the communication has to flow very strongly um when you're in a remote environment and we actually do that using discord discord as we know is such a brilliant platform for communication i way prefer it to slack i know there's a whole bunch of slack users out there um but we've actually decided not to use slack even though this is for uh an enterprise we decided to just create a discord server we have clients in there that talk directly to the to artists on our team you've got like project managers account managers and everyone just chats together in this uh, in this one group so it really is like creating a discord community but it's a team but anyway um that's mlc uh, in a nutshell uh, what's esg so the the title of this this is uh, about esg policies uh, not everyone might know uh, not know what this means um or, or you might know what it means but you don't realize it so um, an ESG policy it stands for Economic Social Governance, and um, it's a policy that outlines how a company deals with things like DEI, diversity, diversity and inclusion, uh, employee pay, um, impact on the environment, um, being accountable for governance, like you know how you document and monitor risk. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that um, is really important. Uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, employee pay; these are things that impact everyone who works at a company. Um, and these are all positive things, right? That every company should be thinking about. Um, I, but I really wanted to talk about why it matters and why you shouldn't rely on it, basically where it falls short. Uh, and I think that's in unifying people's minds on these issues. So an ESG policy might say something like, we're going to change the procedures uh, in our hiring to make sure we are hiring a diverse group of people. But then what it doesn't actually do is instill that culture in the people in the company. And this is why, and this is actually really important. Um, when you're going out there looking for a company to apply to, uh, you know, there's two ways you could go about this. Either you, sp you do the scattershot approach, uh, you basically apply everywhere, or you spend some time thinking about the types of companies that you want to work for. Um, a lot of you might have in your minds companies that you like to work for. Maybe it's PlayStation or Nintendo. You know, uh, maybe it's just for yourself um, or just some indie games that, that you really like the look of. Um, and all of those could be fantastic. And you might think, oh, I'd like to work for those because I know some people there. Or, um, yeah, you know, maybe you, you, you like the games that they're working on. And they're really valid reasons. But one thing to also look out for is how are people treated? at these companies and um, what are they doing uh, you know that lines with my values so if you care about having a diverse team that's not all white i'd say um or you care that your company isn't you know basically it's not shell creating a, a, a an impact on the on the planet that's very negative then those things are going to be in the esg policy um there's more that will be in there as well and sometimes these things can be quite a read but uh, you can kind of get the gist of where the company is going from them. But I would say, um, if you are looking to find out that information about a company, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't really go to one of these policies. This is this is kind of the problem with the ESG policies in the first place, right? Um, if you rely on these, uh, they actually, you know, I, I just mentioned a minute ago um, how an ESG policy isn't the sort of be all end all. It's not going to change everyone's minds in the company. So what do I really mean by this? Um, and, and remember, try and think of this in the context of, of how, how you can find companies to apply to. So I guess for starters, you know, who reads, who reads these policies? Pr pretty much no one. Um, if somebody does read one of these, these long, lengthy policies, uh, you know, does it really control your thoughts? So if you're, you know, if you're thinking about joining a, co a company and you've read the ESG policy or you've looked into it, 
and it says, oh, the leadership team really care about diversity. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're actively hiring people uh, in, uh, you know, maybe Latin America. We, we really want these different things. Um, that is really great. And, but, but unfortunately, lots of these companies will be saying this in their marketing, but they're not actually living it in the company. And um, this is basically all about avoiding toxicity. Uh, you're trying to find a positive team, right, um, that keeps you happy. So um, I, I think it's pretty tough to know from the outside um, if, if a company is going to be, is going to be right for you. Um, but really, this point is just don't rely uh, on ESG policies. <clears throat> Cool. So I've got a couple of things here that um, are quite interesting. Um, let me just move my thing out of the way so I can see any messages that are coming in. So um, yeah, this is this is something that Yuki, uh, the the UK, the UK Association uh, for Game for the Games Industry, they posted something recently, a report. Some of you may have seen it. Um, it's a fantastic report on diversity in the games industry. And what they found was 70% uh, of application, uh, sorry, 70% of the games industry, uh, or roundabouts there, were male, and around about 30% um, were female, with maybe 2% non binary. So, in terms of um, our sort of non binary, basically non male female genders, um, the games industry is actually pretty high in the percentage if you compare it to the general working population. So it's a pretty positive thing there. We've still got work to do, um, for sure. But it, it's an industry that's very creative. And, um, you know, you often find people who understand how to express themselves. And that can mean, um, you know, deciding uh, or, or looking to other genders. So um, that's that's a pretty positive from it. But the, the negative side is obviously... Um, as we all know, almost half of the working population is female. So um, <laughs> Fox is going to change that. Absolutely. Um, I don't know what the percentage of the working population is for anyone who's non-binary. Um, but I'd be interested to know that stat because the closer it is to that, you know, if it's 2% of the working population, then actually we're, we're in our good spot there. Um, well, we're in our, our minimum spot. But the problem with the male-female ratio here, and, and so I'm actually a Women in Games ambassador, and it's something I talk about a lot because um, what we're finding is there are loads of uh, uh, females in the industry or, or females who want to get in the industry who just aren't applying because it's statistically shown. Uh, I can't remember the stats, so it's not that reliable, but it's statistically been shown that um, if a man is, is qualified, semi-qualified for a job, they will go ahead and apply. But if the same goes for a female and they're not fully qualified, just like that male was, they're actually less likely to apply. So we've actually got this crisis of, of people not actually applying. And I wanted to show you how that affects companies like MLC because we are such a diverse team. We have people from everywhere on the planet. Um, and and it's, it's not about hiring people for the sake of diversity. It's about giving everyone the same opportunity. We don't hire anyone uh, because because they're from a certain part of the world. Um, we hire people based on talent and skills. And, and being a remote team has actually allowed us to do that. But then we have this problem, right? Uh, if 70% if of applications coming through, 7 out of 10 applications, if they're male, uh, that leaves us with about <laughs> 3 out of 100 applications who are non-white, non-male. So you can see if we're trying to hire a more diverse team, which speaks, you know, this. There's so much out there on the positives of diversity uh, in a team. It's undeniably better to have a diverse team for employees, for the success of the company, uh, for the output of the company and what they're actually producing. Everything is better with, with you know, diversity. You don't want, you know, it's, it's too important to have just one mindset. You have to have multiple. But if we're hiring uh, and we only get three out of 10, 100 applications as non-white, non-male, the chances of us actually having a diverse team go quite low. So we're doing a few things to, to help combat this. But just so you can see what that actually looks like, it's, it's bloody tiny. Um, and you can see if, if, we, just, if we just hired uh, everyone equally, our team would look like this. We would have a nearly 75% male team. Uh, and it's not, it's not very diverse, right? So. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can look out for, actually, as well, uh, that companies actually have accreditations for. The, again, you know, the, they're not entirely reliable. Uh, just like we were saying with the ESG policy, when you're looking at a company to apply for, 
you can get an indication of of how they believe in these different things and if they share your values but um but you really need to try and find out some more information by you know looking for their social media talking to people who work there and that sort of thing uh, but here are some uh, accreditations that actually are are they're really great. Um, you've got Yuki Raise the Game, which is all about. Uh, there's actually three pillars of Yuki Raise the Game. I definitely implore you to go look at that. Uh, I can't remember what those pillars exactly are, but they are about um, diversity, not just in uh, who we're hiring as as companies, but also what games we're producing and are these games accessible. Um, women in games. I mentioned I'm an ambassador of them. That's all about encouraging women to apply. Um, which is a challenge in its own right, unfortunately, just because there's uh, uh, lots of male-centric um, things out there where you know it's not exactly an inviting environment. There's GBC, which we're part of, a uh, good business charter. Um, it's about paying people how they should be paid. There's actually a, a fun fact that always seems to blow people's minds, which I think is just so standard, is uh, we don't, when we hire, okay, I'm not going to call out any names, but there are lots of, outsourcing art studios out there right there's there's loads we've got loads of competition but lots of them hire from countries where the cost of living is much lower so you might have an outsourcing studio with you know a massive team in ukraine um, or maybe bulgaria or somewhere um with like a tiny head office maybe in the states or like singapore or something like that uh, that's a pretty common structure. States, Ukraine, Singapore, they're like the three main offices that you'll find with outsourcing studios. And, um, you know, it's it's been fantastic to help these developing countries or countries that just have less money, like Ukraine uh, or Bulgaria. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily developing, but, you know, maybe they are less funded than somewhere like Germany. Uh, it's been great in sort of elevating the, the workforce there, but it... It isn't really great for, for pay. We have somebody in our team from, from Ukraine, um, and we hired her originally from an outsourcing studio. And uh, I, I can't remember, but I think they were paying something like two or three euros an hour. And um, she's here, actually. I think maybe if she's listening in, it's Margot. And uh, what an amazing talent she is, <laughs> wasted on two or three euros an hour, I can assure you. Um, so what GBC is all about is paying people at least in the UK, it's at least national living wage. Uh, I don't think we pay anyone national living wage. You pay more than that. Um, but, you know, to us, it's so important that you're paid um, your worth, not just what uh, what's in your country. We had somebody in, um, in Colombia, actually, who was um, very experienced and, and, and great at what he does. And he was he was being paid forty five dollars an hour. And you can imagine in Colombia, he, he, he actually bought an Audi. <laughs> you can imagine in Colombia, that's pretty good. But he, cho he chooses to live there, right? Um, it shouldn't affect his his skills are, are equal. It shouldn't affect his his pay. Uh, we had another person from Brazil. Uh, this was a funny one. He applied to MLC. Um, he he got through to a trial with us, and uh, we asked him how much he wants to be paid an hour. He said six dollars. I was like, no way. <laughs> You're not being paid six dollars an hour. That's that's you can be paid more than that here. Um, so uh, I think he ended up getting 15 or $20 an hour, um, but he was more junior to be fair. So uh, he's going to work up from there. But that's really important. Um, POC and play, uh, people of color, that is, and out making games. It's all about the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community. Gosh, every time I mess that one up. Um, and that, they have a Slack channel, uh, which is, is fantastic. Uh, it's all about you know, promoting it and making sure that people have a space, right? So um, you're looking for companies, going back to the topic here, we're looking for companies when we're, when we're looking to apply somewhere that fit our values. And, and if LGBTQ plus is important to you, look out for out making game sponsors. Um, you know, if you're looking for a supportive environment and you're a woman trying to get in the industry or you've already been in the industry and you're fed up of having calls where there are 10 men and there's just you, um, look out for get, uh, companies that support women in games. Um, these aren't, again, these aren't the be all end all, but they at least tell you um, where the company has its mind. Great, cool. Um, I'm just looking at uh, some of the things here uh, that are coming through. So attended a Women in Games Jam event during uni in the industry week and was a very fun game jam. Nice. Yes, Women in Games does uh, a lot of amazing stuff. Um, they're a really good organization. Uh, are there any communities uh, catered around supporting neuro neurodivergence? Um, I'm not familiar with neurodivergent, 
as a term, oh, autism. I'm sure there are actually. Um, I was talking to somebody in the team the other day, uh, the MLC team, and we were talking about, um, uh, I guess, let's say neurodivergence then. Um, and we were talking about like, what's the, it's, it's not really something that uh, to me actually had come to mind initially um, when I was thinking about diversity, but it absolutely is. Uh, I know Yuki, for example, um, they have, uh, what's his name, uh, Dom over there, um, who is autistic and just does a fantastic job at Yuki. Um, everyone loves him. Uh, he does a really good job. So I think it's, uh, to me, it's all about assigning, you know, the right sort of opportunities to the right people. Uh, and I think um, there are lots of people out there w who are neurodivergent uh, who um, can absolutely contribute massively to this industry. So it's really important, again, to to include diversity again. Uh, but I don't know any communities that are centered around it. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure there are some. I'll look out for some, actually. That's a good idea. Yeah, what I was saying before about... Hang on, let me click on the thing. Uh, what I was saying before about this... And Nina's going to look into it. There you go. Um, it's all about helping to make sure that we can diversify our applications. So if, you know... If anyone here, if you consider yourself in um, a diversity category of any sort, and diversity is such a wide thing, um, basically, if you're not uh, me, if you're not non, if you're not white male, um, you can maybe call yourself a diverse group. Uh, but but uh, you know, without putting any labels on anything, it's it's really just um, finding finding opportunities that that want want you um, and, and not toxic environments. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm going round and round about this. I'm trying to keep this quite informal. I wanted to sort of have that discussion with everyone and see what interesting things come up. Awesome. So um, <clears throat> how, do, how do we actually deal with this uh, ESG? I've, I've spoken about a couple of things here. Um, but as I mentioned, we are always hiring. So um, anyone here who is looking to apply, I do employ you to do so. And we are hiring at the moment our artists. We've got lots of different roles, uh, 3D, 2D, um, also design roles like UI, um, uh, game design, actually is a big one, uh, level design, that sort of thing. Uh, we're not currently hiring any programmers, but I would recommend you still apply, I believe, uh, because we, it's always nice to have those contacts. We have lots of clients who need your help. Um, but why would you bother applying? So we've talked about finding a company that aligns with your values. And I would say before you even consider applying, you'd need to hear about how MLC deals with ESG. Um, because you want to know first, is MLC going to line up with what you believe in? And that's what this talk's all about. So here, let's have a look. What do we do? Um, so firstly, shared values and authenticity. This one is super important. I, uh, I'm a strong believer that you can't force anyone to um, change their mind uh, in a way. I, I think people are able to change their mind, but it's something that they go through themselves. And uh, uh, if you're if you're hiring a team that you have, you're <laughs> going back to the title. If you're hiring a team uh, and you're forcing an ESG policy to them, that's not going to make uh, make that person believe in diversity. So if you hire somebody who's intrinsically homophobic. Um, maybe they don't, obviously don't come across that way in the interview, but if they don't have the values that you share with diversity and inclusivity and equal opportunity and that sort of thing, um, how can you expect your team to? So we don't just, you know, say, oh, leadership team, uh, uh, make sure everyone's, you know, inclusive. That, that's ridiculous. What we do is we first, we think about this before we've hired anyone. We sit down, have that interview, and we're looking in this interview. There's something in here somewhere about hiring on attitude, I thought I'd put. Um, but we hire based on attitude. So once we've seen a portfolio, once that's come through, uh, if the skills are there for what we're looking for, then um, uh, all that's left is to check the values and the authenticity of, of who they are as a person and their attitude, right? So hiring people who, who have shared values and who are authentic is the very first step um, in what we do. Uh, and we're also authentic in what we do as well. I, I, had a, I did a talk at the uh, Yuki Hub Crawl a couple of weeks ago. And I remember I started speaking about hiring juniors. And I, I remember this was a conversation that we just had in the previous talk that people were asking about. Um, but the challenge is always like, you know, if you're a junior, how, how do you actually get hired in this bloody industry? 
And I was of the mentality that um, we do hire juniors uh, and we, we give opportunities to juniors as and when we can. It's not always possible, but when it is possible, it's a really good thing to do. And uh, <laughs> later on, when we were having some drinks, uh, the lady came up to me and, and she'd spoken with our newly appointed talent manager. Uh, and she was amazed. He's 19. He's currently a student. Um, but his attitude is is spot on and he knows what he's doing. So even though, you know, he might not have 10 years experience and he was up against people with five years experience in talent managing for the same salary, um, we ended up hiring somebody who's younger, less experienced, but had the right attitude. So, um, you know, put your money where your mouth is. If you're a company that has uh, has all these values, prove it. Um, be authentic. And that's that's exactly what we try to do. Um, cool. And then uh, help and support at all levels. This one is uh, really important. Uh, I think I think Jagex were talking about this just a minute ago about having lead artists and that sort of thing. This is having a lead artist is actually super crucial, especially if you're more junior. Um, but I think to anyone, having a lead artist is really important. Uh, a, a lead artist, an art director, project manager, these sort of things um, really help you to get the support you need in your company. Uh, and this can be beyond just your like art or programming work, but actually, you know, if you're struggling mentally, um, mental health isn't something I've spoken about in this call, but I think it's so important. Um, if you know, we don't want any crunch culture. Uh, we want to we want to work on stuff because we're passionately enjoying it. And if we work overwork or ignore mental issues early on, they can develop into something where the passion is driven out of what you do. So making sure that there is help and support for mental health, um, for the work you do, all of this is super important and something you should look out for when applying to a company, making sure that they've got those roles in place. Um, well, I don't want to like discourage anyone from applying to industry studios. Industry studios are often quite good at all of these things I'm talking about. Not always. Um, really, you need to look at the founder of the industry studio. If the founder of the studio fits your values, and they're like a three or four man team, maybe even a 10 man team, you can almost guarantee the rest of the team will follow that if they're a good leader, right? So um, look look to the founder if you're looking at Indie. But if you're looking at a, a larger company, I'm saying maybe 20 plus, um, then yeah, you want to expect, you'd expect that help and support is at all levels. Uh, what we do is a flat hierarchy. This isn't essential. Um, it's quite nice to have structure in your work, but a flat hierarchy, if you don't know, is essentially um not having levels of bosses i would say that's how i'd probably describe it so you know i'm founder of mlc so i'm studio director what does that really mean well it means i have set responsibilities that i have to look after it doesn't mean that i am the boss of a 3d character artist because a 3d character artist knows what they're doing and they're the boss of their work and then their lead artist is helping to support them so personally you know People, I think, in the company will see this slightly differently to I do. But I think it's super important to um, not get super hung up on hierarchies and titles and every get everyone on board with the same mission, which is something that we work hard to do. Um, I actually forgot to mention earlier on as well that 60% uh, of our leadership team, if you want to call them that, uh, basically our project managers, account managers, me, um those sort of people 60 percent of them are actually female which is so cool um but only 35 percent of our artists are female so um interesting that kind of goes back to this one here really uh cool and then finally and my last point on here i'm, I'm interested to dive into the channel to see what people are saying but um hiring on attitude not not plain skills and experience um so the question I think in the previous talk was that centered around, uh, I'm a junior, how, how do I, I can't apply to any work because they need three, four years experience. Uh, and I think this is what people are, are saying at the moment in the chat. Yeah, um, it's an annoying, it's an annoying caveat or not ca it's an annoying aspect of the, in the, or the games industry, right? Um, how is it combated? I don't think we're going to resolve that today, but I can absolutely see what I can do. So hiring an attitude, not playing skills and experience. What does that mean for MLC? Well, once we've seen a portfolio that sparks interest, um, and actually once we've, once we've actually got somebody in who we're looking to hire, we'll then conduct a quick chat. 
And this is before an interview. So I've done this with many uh, post postgrads and a couple students. Um, we'll have this quick chat. We'll sit down and we'll talk about you know what it is that they love doing. Remember, we talked about passion earlier um, and games industry's passion. So we hire people who are looking to be passionate. So we ask, what is it that you absolutely love to work on? Like, what's your thing? Um, what are you really good at? What do you try to avoid? And um, you know, what do you want? For your career where are you going as a freelancer or, or as an employee and finding these things out early on helps me to picture where they're going to fit in our team so you know everyone can answer these questions regardless of if you've done 10 years if you've on your first year right once we've done that we'll have a quick uh, we'll have an interview now an interview is should be tailored to the role so um we shouldn't be asking questions in interviews that uh, only somebody with at least four, five, or even two or three professional experience would know the answer to. What we should really be asking questions about is their education. And that's something that we do um, with with juniors. We ask about, you know, what are the, some of the projects that you worked on at university or um, in your own time? Uh, it doesn't even have to be university if you can show the skills. Um, but understanding workflow, and, and this is really important for juniors. Uh, you have to you have to totally get your own workflow um, and have confidence in it too. You'll always have stuff to learn, sure, um, but you really want to create a, an environment that works the way you want it. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you're using ZBrush and then you know retopologizing in something like Blender, um, you or, or TypoGun or something like that, you want to figure out a workflow uh, and build a workflow, a pipeline in essence, where you you always do similar thing in there and you want to try and improve that pipeline and workflow um, as you progress through your career but having confidence behind what you've done is so important um, and constantly constantly learning i'll show i i wish i could show you some portfolios if i if i'd got some um, permission to do so i would i would show you some uh portfolios just to kind of give you some live um feedback really because i think they're quite useful um but yeah so uh, what, what's coming here so um I've got a question here from Natalie Jones. So the hardest thing for me is I'm an associate 3D artist who's had experience for over a year. It's extremely hard trying to find the right level to apply for jobs. Is there anything you could suggest for this? So find the right level. You mean nobody's trying to hire somebody with um, just over a year's of experience or people trying to hire for over two years, over three years? Is that If that's the issue, um, then I think, yeah, I think, I think you're maybe when you're applying, and, and I might be wrong here, but maybe when applying, don't lean too much on your experience. Uh, your ex if if you're a junior, your experience is not your selling point, is it? It's actually going to hold you back. And um, uh, I'm just reading the chat there. Yeah, your experience is absolutely holding you back. So um, you're you're going to be looking for something else that can sell your skills and sell who you are. So firstly, you want to get that passion in there. Um, that's an inevitable. Everyone's hiring on passion. So if you haven't got the passion, forget it. But uh, your work should also be really top notch. You don't have to have years of experience to produce good quality work. Uh, uh, but you do, I mean, you have to give yourself some time to have a wide por portfolio or wide variety of work. But just being able to demonstrate your skills through your portfolio is the first step. So if you're finding it hard, hmm. I wonder if you're, I have a question actually to everyone here who is junior. Are you finding it hard to apply or are you finding it hard to get an interview? Because they're kind of two different things. I mean, finding it hard to apply would be not having confidence in yourself, uh, but finding it hard to get to the interview um, is, is totally different. Uh, that's more, I, well, I could say it's more out of your hands. It can be, uh, it can be, but there are things you can do. So, I mean, I guess my first question then to everyone who said it's the interview process is, you know, how many things do you have on your art station? Um, if I mean, when I go to, if I'm looking at a portfolio on art station, uh, and I can see this person has two or three things on there, and I also check when these things were were created and uploaded, by the way. And if I can see there's two or three things on there, the latest one was from a year ago, and they've added nothing else on there, you know, I've skipped over that. Um, uh, Finicky Spade here has nine pieces on ArtStation and a little bit on LinkedIn. That's pretty good. Nine pieces is better. I understand, by the way, how difficult it is to build up a, you know, like 
30 pieces of work on a portfolio. That's something for later, right? Um, Green Bullet has four, but has taken a few off. Yeah, that's that's also another strategy, right? Uh, just going with super high quality. I actually hired somebody the other day who did exactly that. They had three things on their portfolio, and I was desperate to hire them um, because those three things were such high quality. I thought, if this is what they can produce on their first try, imagine what they could produce with with more time or training. Uh, so that's also quite a, a good thing to show off. You don't really want to show off anything that you're no longer proud of. You need to you need to be taking those off of uh, ArtStation or, or wherever you're showing your work. Um, you really want to show off your, your very best work. If I see one character you've created and it's phenomenal, that's going to give me a better impression than one amazing character and two rubbish ones. Because I'm going to assume maybe that very good character, you didn't do the texturing. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe you had some help. You know, I'm not going to believe it because you had two other pieces that just came before that that didn't fit that quality. So I would try and find uh, work that you've completed that's consistently high in quality, um, not just one or two. I, I, maybe that's helpful. I don't know. But that's the way I usually look at it. Um, let's see. I have five big projects, finished games with a team. Well, that's, that's great. Um, then a bunch more little work like concepts, in-depth design, and prototypes. Great. So that's uh that's always a really good sign when you've had big projects finished with a team um i can imagine you're probably already finding it a little bit easier to get hired that's also one part though right getting a big project with a team but more importantly uh, or, or you know more relevantly um a bunch of more little work like concepts in-depth designs and prototypes so let's say you're want you want to add something else to your portfolio um this has turned into a portfolio uh, session, but I think it's I think it's providing value. So let's keep going. Um, let's say you want to add some work to your portfolio. First thing you need to come up with an idea or, or find a concept piece to work from, right? And um, and then you need to decide what it is that you want to create. Uh, and you'll probably be creating something because you're enjoying it and, and whatever. What you really want to be careful of is your scope, because there's no point trying to create now. There are different ways to approach a portfolio. I know I just said stick to very high quality and few. That's one method. The other method is lots of projects that are good quality um, that show critical thinking. So what do I mean by that? Uh, find, uh, you know, create um, some projects. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my words. Let's create a personal project that, that fits with what you want to do in the industry, um, but try and keep the scope fairly small. So there's no point trying to create, you know, an open world if if that's going to take you months and months of work. Try and create something that you can finish with pride in a couple of weeks. Uh, once you've done that, move on to something else. Um, you can always come back and polish it more later once you've got some new skills that you've learned. But as a like game designer, as um, who was it that was saying that? Um, Benji. Uh, as a game designer, as Benji was saying, having different concepts, in-depth designs and prototypes and that sort of thing as a game designer is exactly what you want to show. Variety uh, is a good one for, for that skill. Um, something like uh, prop modeling, I would say variety is also important. Um, for something like character modeling, uh, it's hard to, to give variety when things just take so long to produce. It could take you 10 hours to build a prop and then you can move on to the next one, but it could take you 50 hours to make one character. So you can see how different portfolios will have different amounts of work, but the studio that's hiring you will understand that. Well, at least should. <laughs> um, let's see here. So I have more than five years experience um, in 3D in general, but trying to make the switch to VFX for games. So I'm applying for junior VFX roles. My question is, how likely to get a junior job remotely? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I've personally, I've looked around, and I'm finding it difficult to find remote jobs for juniors. Um, but I do think they exist. So it depends what you're looking for work, uh, how you're looking to work. If you're working, um, if you're looking for something that you can do long term. You know, maybe it's a big studio or something like that. I think you might struggle if you haven't got the work in your portfolio. So I would almost advise trying to find some smaller projects to start with um, and hop between them or do multiple at the same time. So, you know, potentially being freelance, 
uh, and trying um, you know two or three different games at once. Uh, I would probably say it really depends on on how much you're reliant on finance. Um, if you're looking for something that can fund your life, uh, you know, freelance can be a bit scary, uh, and also it distracts from um, from the artwork that you're doing. Well, this is what MLC is all about, right? This is the whole point of MLC. It allows you to be a freelancer, uh, work, work remotely, work in your own time, set your own quotes, and have stability. Um, that last bit there is not something that every freelancer has. So it's kind of like the benefits of being employed, but with all the benefits of being a freelancer. There aren't many of these around. I haven't actually heard of anything that does something similar, um, but we might see an increase of it. We, we hire a lot of people, um, quite a lot. We, in fact, we, like I was saying earlier, we actually hired a talent acquisition manager to hire more people. So uh, I know lots of studios have those, but um, yeah, we do, we do do a few hires. We don't have, uh, we don't always have immediate work for people as they join MLC. Sometimes we do. It depends on the role. Sometimes people join and they're immediately full time. Other times people join and it takes a couple of weeks to get a gig, uh, and then a couple, maybe a month or something to get another gig. It, it really depends on on the role. Uh, but what roles are currently available at MLC? Well, we've got um, animators. Gosh, if you're an animator and you can't find work, <laughs> you definitely need to apply to MLC. That I, I've heard that animation is uh, highly sought after at the moment because during COVID, oh uh, no, what was it? Uh, there was there was something that happened. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Something happened, and um, uh, they all went to DreamWorks or something. <laughs> oh, it was the layoffs. That's it. The layoffs from uh, a couple of companies. I can't remember who it was. Uh, a whole bunch of the animators went off to the film industry. So come back, come back to games. It's much cooler. <laughs> it's much better. So yeah, we need uh, we need some animators. We also could use a couple more 3D character modelers, um, a couple uh, 3D prop modelers, both realism and stylized. What else do we need? Um, we unfortunately don't need sound. If you're in the business of sound, I do not envy you. Uh, it's a tricky place to be. Um, it's you know we for anyone who's ever posted a hiring post uh, or applied to one. Uh, there were a hundred other people who were applying for that studio, but for sound. You know, if if we go to hire a 3D prop modeler on Reddit, you know, we'll get ten, twenty applications for sound design, which is which sucks for sound people. But yes, Fidiki Spade, apply. Uh, 3D prop modelers, that's correct. Um, we we would like some. How do you apply to jobs while still in full time uni and unable to start work until you finish? Hmm, this is interesting. I We actually hired a student not too long ago um, who worked with us for just over a month before they moved over to Ubisoft, and uh, which I did warn them about, don't worry. <laughs> but um, they uh, they actually, what they did is they, they decided, well, it depends on how much time you've got on the side of full-time uni. They had some time, so they managed to find, you know, like uh, indie game jobs on the side that only needed maybe 10 hours a week um and that was that was good um you're looking maybe try and find like a uh, student support programs that companies have we're looking to build one one day when we've got the resources we want to build like mlc academy where uh, existing students can apply to mlc start learning our processes and skills and that sort of thing so that by the time you come out of university um you've kind of got you know you've already hit the ground running then and that's that's super cool i really want to do that uh, we just need to get the resources to do it because um, this is the problem from, let's say, my side of the hiring process. I can't hire students or junior people who need loads of handholding unless we have got the resource to help manage that. Uh, in the slide here, I think it's still on the screen, help and support at all levels, um, junior being one of those levels if we can't help and support a junior person we will not hire you because you need help and support you know if uh, if you're working with a client and something breaks and you've never experienced that before um you could be running around in circles stressing yourself out trying to get it sorted but in reality you just need the support so we'll we only hire juniors when we can currently i think we can so i think it'd be good to to apply if you are junior but but junior, when I say junior, I don't mean people who don't have a portfolio. And I don't mean people who are kind of just starting to learn. That's not quite 
enough for MLC. I mean, we've got clients who pay a lot of money for a premium service. So to us, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, but it does matter how skilled you are. So if you are able to produce top-notch work that, that you've only got one or two years, or, or maybe it's your first years of experience, but you're still ama- amazing at what you do, you know, it doesn't matter if you've only got one year's experience. Um, you, you could be better than somebody with three years' experience. But if you're, you know, you've got maybe one or two things in your art station, you haven't really got into your rhythm yet. Um, I would say develop your skills because it's a highly competitive market, uh, and developing your skills is something you should do even when you're senior. Um, you should never stop developing your skills. You're never, you're never the best. Uh, if you are the best, you're the best for about five minutes until somebody else is the best. So it's so important to constantly. Um, constantly develop new ideas new skills use the tools that are coming out like ue5 everyone here should have at least had a try if you've if you if you worked in ue4 you should have at least been playing with ue5 uh and you know every time the new versions come out of all these softwares um you need to be on top of those you also need to be on top of uh art style trends uh that's a really important one um don't don't get stuck in an old art style because when a new art style comes along if you're not able to to understand it uh, even if your skills are there, you're going to fall short again. You know, what worked a few years ago for things, for games like Firewatch or The Long Dark might not work in 2022. Um, probably won't work in 23 either. Uh, things like Fall Guys, uh, you know, that worked pretty well. Fortnite worked pretty well. These are art styles too, bear in mind, that, that led on other games. Um, Sable uh, was a, another beautiful game. Cuphead, you know, all of these are are kind of staple games right and they've all got these unique art styles but it changes over time nobody's going to produce um well it's not really right i mean cuphead's quite unique but, but sable is too but you know people are trying to always find new art styles and as artists um you have to you have to try and find those too it's actually really tough <laughs> so i hope that's you know provided some value if, if you guys have got any other questions please do throw them in the chat um it's been a pleasure talking with everyone anyway uh, I feel like we've we've had like a an informal discussion. It's been nice. I can't see anyone, and nobody can see me, but I am here. I have a fan on because it's bloody hot, but um, it's like forty one degrees. It's amazing. So yeah, um, if uh, if that's pretty much everyone's questions, then um, yeah, I'm pretty much done. Thank you so much for listening and staying in. Uh, you guys are amazing. Best of luck with wherever you're applying to. Um, even if you're switching your career up and you've been in the industry for 10 years, you know, best of luck. Um, do apply. Anina has posted a couple of links in there. She may post another one just in case you missed it. Um, but yeah, best of luck. Thanks, everyone. Catch you all soon. See you later.